start talking again about hybridization and why this is necessary. This is one of these fundamental building blocks. This is like in chess, you're learning one of the pieces, how it moves. You learn this, you can use it. If you don't understand this stuff, it doesn't get any better from here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the idea that carbon from the periodic table, its electron structure does not match carbon in molecules. We'll see very quickly that if we look at a molecule like CH4, methane, which is the simplest organic molecule you'll deal with, uh, it has this shape, and we can prove this shape. We can look at this shape uh, by all sorts of different techniques, and we can see that it's this. It's a, a set shape called a tetrahedron, and we now have to worry about the fact that carbon in the middle, it doesn't quite make sense in terms of what you get from the periodic table for carbon. So if you, if you think about what we tried to do on Friday, we started introducing these pictures, these energy level diagrams showing the horizontals being the orbitals and showing the arrows being the electrons. And you have to worry about what type of orbitals are involved, and then you must populate them with the electrons. So most of what I'll do today is this, and I'll do it in recitation two. You must get this as soon as you possibly can. In that molecule, you have four hydrogens, one carbon. Each hydrogen brings with it to the game one electron from a 1s orbital. So there's the 1s orbital as the horizontal, and there's the 1s electron now that is half populated. So if I have a carbon in the middle, it needs help. It needs four electrons, because it only has four valence electrons. It needs four more. That's why it bonds with four hydrogens. Remember from the other day, hydrogen has one bond. That's it. Carbon has a maximum of four. That's it. So with that in mind, uh, we're not going to worry too much about the 1s electrons, because they don't do very much. They're inside. They don't react. We are going to worry about the 2s, and we're going to worry about the 2p. Again, I, I sort of uh, defined on Friday this idea of 2px, 2py, and 2pz. They are split along the Cartesian coordinates. They are degenerate. They have the same energy, same shape, same size. Uh, they only differ by their direction in space. But if we think about how those two atoms have to come together, or those, sorry, those five atoms have to come together to get that molecule, it isn't quite straightforward. Because I'm dealing with two s electrons here and one s electron, sorry, two p electrons there and two p electrons there. They, if they mix with the hydrogens, would not give you four equal bonds. That's impossible. If you're using two s electrons for one type of bond and two p electrons for another type of bond, they will not give you the same type of bond at the end. So we'll find out very quickly that this doesn't quite add up for this type of molecule. And the hybridization patterns you have to learn, there are only three of them. There are sp3, sp2, and sp. And then you can apply this idea to any of the atoms at the top right of the periodic table that we have to worry about, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. What we'll do this week in practice and recitation is just do many, many of these so that you get the idea. It sinks in great. Well, the, the problem is that we have different electrons in the 2s and the 2p, but we're trying to make four equivalent bonds. So how do you do this? We have to come up with a model that helps us get the, the answer, helps explain the actual reality in nature. So you could imagine, okay, I need four bonds. And typically in a covalent bond, each atom brings an electron with it. And you get the two orbitals overlapping, you get the two electrons come together, you get a bond. That would be a single bond or a sigma bond, as we call it. Well, one possible solution to this is to take what we call the ground state electronic configuration of carbon from the periodic table and take one of the 2s electrons and bump it up to the 2p. Because now, probably, I could form four single bonds. I have four half-filled orbitals in my new picture. I have a singly or a singly occupied s orbital, and I have three singly occupied p orbitals. I have the bits and pieces I would need to make four bonds from carbon out to hydrogen. But the problem now is the same. I still have different orbitals. I have a 2s, and I have three 2ps. That's no good, because that will not contribute to four equivalent bonds. So we need to think about another way of doing this, and what we call hybridization, to come up with that answer. I need four equivalent bonds, therefore I need four equivalent orbitals from carbon to form those bonds. So what we'll do is something called hybridization. We will mix the orbitals, and we'll get something called, in this case, an sp3 orbital, and it will explain the pattern. It will explain how carbon forms that molecule and many molecules like it. And as you see this from the beginning, it's not mysterious. You, you crack it early on, and then any carbon with just single bonds attached will have the same hybridization. Any carbon with a double bond will have the same hybridization. Any carbon with two double bonds has the same hybridization. Okay? We've got to build up those models and then start to apply it. So thinking about on the left, we just said, all right, if I promote that one electron to the 2p orbital, I'm halfway there. I now have four half-filled orbitals that could come together with hydrogens to form four bonds. But you would not get four equivalent bonds. So what we'll do now is what we started talking about on Friday, which is mixing, hybridizing, taking the s orbital, which is the horizontal, and the orbitals that are at the p level here, three of them, are mixing them all together. So where does my name come from? All of a sudden, I'm saying sp3. Well, I'm taking a single s orbital, and I'm taking three of the p orbitals, sp3. 
I'm using all of the orbitals at that level in the valence shell that are available to me to make orbitals that will then con contribute to single bonds. If it's all single bonds, from now on you'll say it's sp3. Once we've got the orbitals, we have sort of solved most of the problem. We have now four degenerate orbitals, four equivalent orbitals in their shape, in their size, in their, maybe not in the direction of space, but certainly in terms of their energy. And now we have to populate them. So what we'll do is we'll take the four electrons. The electrons are the little arrows. We have four of them. One of them came from the 2s, and then two of them, three of them came from the 2p level, four of them total. And you simply put them in place. You fill up singly before you double up. That's a fundamental law that you've learned before. And you end up with this. And this is a really nice model and a really nice picture for how carbon can now present itself into a molecule like CH4 and form four equivalent bonds. Now, this works. This works. It's accepted. We can prove these structures. We know the shape of these molecules. We're working backwards now and trying to explain how it happened. It can't just come from S and P orbitals. It must come from somewhere in between. But you'll notice here on this slide that the energy level, because this axis is energy, the energy of these orbitals is somewhere in between, right? It's not as low as the S, it's not as high as the P, it's somewhere in between, which should make sense because you hybridize and mix those, you should end up somewhere as an average. So far, so good? This isn't bad when you get started, but when you start doing nitrogen and oxygen and lone pairs and all kinds of things, it can get quite tricky, so make sure you start asking questions. With that in mind, we can think about how carbon then presents itself, and you can form a molecule like CH4. The sp3 orbitals themselves will have different shapes to S and P because they're a hybrid, they're somewhere in between. And it turns out your typical sp3 orbital from carbon has this type of shape. It looks somewhat like a p orbital. It has two lobes, but it certainly isn't symmetrical like a p orbital. It has one, orb one uh, lobe pointing in that direction, one lobe pointing in that direction. You'd argue that this lobe is a bit more spherical than it would be in a regular p orbital. So you do have the hybridization, you do have the mixing of the original orbitals. The s was spherical, the p was dumbbell, and you end up somewhere in between. So as we start to put these orbitals together onto atoms, you've got to be careful. It gets quite confusing. And we'll have to start worrying about the fact that electrons, when they're in orbitals, are going to repel other electrons. So we're going to have to worry about shape. We're building up to shape. We'll talk about different types of shape in, in carbon and oxygen and nitrogen molecules. And it's all pretty straightforward, if you get it. The idea now that electrons want to be away from each other. Two electrons will try to be as far away as possible from each other. Two pairs of electrons will try and be as far away as possible from each other. And that will dictate the shape of the molecule. So there are some shapes to come up that you might have heard before. There are some electronic characteristics that you may have seen before. You certainly will now. And this, again, is a, is a fundamental building block of the organic sequence. So th this now is a more complicated picture. This is putting those orbitals onto a carbon and trying to work out why it adopts this shape. Why is it something called a tetrahedron? And you can see on the right-hand side, in fact, in both pictures here, we have the tetrahedron shape. It's a triangular-based pyramid. Any ideas why it adopts this shape? Anybody been reading? Go ahead. It's stable. Why is it stable? That's the furthest away the electrons can get from each other. So you have four bond pairs of electrons. You have four single bonds emanating from that central carbon. And the furthest away those pairs of electrons can get from each other is not in a cross. It's not something like this. It is a tetrahedron. And if you buy the models or you come to my office, introduce yourselves, and we have a model kit right there, I can show you exactly why this is the case. You try and bend some of these bonds so they're closer to each other, doesn't work. You try and bend some of these bonds so they're further away from each other, other bonds get closer. This is the best average. So the shape of this molecule, CH4, is described as tetrahedral around the central carbon where the four orbitals used to bond in those CH bonds are sp3. What orbitals are being used from the hydrogens? S. It's as simple as it gets, right? You can't modify that. It's a 1S. That's it. That was used to, to, to bond together and give you the CH4 molecule. So right now you have a new piece of information that the sp3 hybrid carbon is tetrahedral. Every time you see even a very complex molecule, if it has four single bonds, chances are it will be tetrahedral. So we have different depictions. Go ahead. So you don't have to worry about the S because they're not the, the, the S on the carbon because they're irrelevant, right? So emanating from carbon, you've got four individual sp3 orbitals. You've got to be very careful here because you you know all the numbers start to blend into each other. Four is the number of them. Sp3 is the type of them. And then within that sp3, one fourth is S and three fourths is P because you took one of these and three of these and that's how it works out. Okay, just got to keep it straight. 
So we have different depictions, and you'll find organic chemistry, again, my job is to get you someplace else, is to get you into biochemistry or uh, some of the engineering ideas in polymers and things like that. Big molecules, biological molecules. And we have to have different ways of representing systems because we have different information that's required, and sometimes the molecules get so big that it's impossible, to, for example, to draw all the atoms out. So you'll see here four quite different looking pictures that are trying to show different aspects of a molecule like methane. On the left, we have a simple model that you could build with the plastic kit, if you buy that. Uh, it doesn't show you very much. It does show you projection into space. It shows you that this model isn't flat, for example. It has three-dimensional structure, and when we get to chapter five, it's all about three-dimensional structure. The second one, B, is the ball and stick model. It shows you now that these are actually spheres, or there's actually electron density there, and this isn't just a whole bunch of rods stuck, stuck together. There are atoms at the end of this. And then the more realistic one, C, which you will see in the lab when you do the first lab experiment next week, is this idea of space filling, this idea of van der Waals radii. What does a molecule really look like to another molecule? It looks more like C. That's the description of the overall volume taken up by the bonds and the atoms and whatever else is attached, so that when this molecule sees another molecule, you realize that they're not sticks, they're not balls, they are electron density. On the right-hand side, we can take a bit further and we can do an electron density map. This will help you show, for example, dipoles. If you've been reading over the weekend, you understand dipoles are the result of electron differences, electronegativity differences. You have delta plus at one end, delta negative at the other end. And unless they cancel out, you'll have some dipole. And you can see that in this type of molecule, in, or this type of depiction, an electron density map, which is trying to show you where the electrons are. And of course, they're in the bonds. We'll use each of these as we go through. For the most part, you'll be seeing this because it's very easy to draw. Uh, but we'll have to be aware as we start to think about chemical reaction, that's what a molecule looks more like. Go ahead. Yeah, so the blue is cold and the red is hot. Okay, so the blue is where the electron density isn't, and the red is where it is. And you can see it's in the bonds, roughly. Okay, and we'll see those again. You'll get introduced to this in, in lab. Make sure you show up to lab. Um, and that use of that ChemDraw program is quite useful to get you started on this idea. So we can expand this. And again, you know, I'm not overdoing this by saying if you learn the stuff in the first four weeks, the rest of it falls into place, because it does. You can expand this to molecules that aren't as simple as CH4. This is C2H6. This is ethane. Don't worry about the names yet. We'll spend a lot of time on that in the near future. Uh, but both of these carbons, now, if I were to draw this thing out, I have carbon, hydrogen at one end, another H here, another H here. And from methane, I swapped out one of the hydrogens and replaced it with another carbon. So it's a bit more complicated. There are more atoms involved. But really, that's the only way I can do this. I can't draw any more isomers for that thing. I can't do any more constitutional isomers like you've been practicing on the homework from chapter one. Um, but I have to worry about the shape. It certainly doesn't look like this. It isn't flat. This thing is three-dimensional. Again, it's because of the projection in space of the different orbitals coming from the central carbons. You can think now, in the same vein as what we just did, that bond will be the same as it was in methane. It will be sp3 from carbon, and it will be 1s from hydrogen. Same idea. But this is a different system, so how can you trust the idea of, of it being the same sort of bonding? It's all single bonds. I'm trying to write some things down that maybe are not so obvious just now. These are all single bonds. If I have some pi bonds, things will change in a minute. But right now, everything is simple. All single bonds, the carbon is sp3 hybridized. And then when you extrapolate to nitrogen and oxygen, same idea. All sigma, all single bonds, the central atom there will be sp3 hybridized. So I've now got ethane. It's a wee bit different. Uh, I've got this bigger methyl group on the end instead of a hydrogen. We'll have to worry about size in the near future. Okay? Larger things tend to want to get away from each other. We have this idea of steric problems. You'll see that a lot in the near future. Uh, but overall, this molecule will have roughly the same shape around the carbons. The carbon here and the carbon here are both sp3 hybridized. So you should expect them to adopt a tetrahedral geometry. Same idea. And you make that molecule much bigger, you put in a, a 25, 30 carbons. If they all have single bonds, they will all be sp3 hybridized. Is everybody OK? They'll be awake? OK. Well, we need to worry about three patterns. We worry about sp3, in which we've used all of the available valence electrons to form hybrid orbitals, because we just need single bonds. And I'll say this carefully. It is the hybrid orbitals that contribute to the single bonds say that again. It is the hybrid orbitals that contribute to the single bonds. So in sp3, they're all hybrid orbitals. They all go to single bonds, or what I've described as a sigma bond. Well, now we have to move on to a double bond. And I, I, I know some of you have seen this. Some of you haven't. It's probably a, uh, 
a good idea to make sure that we start from scratch and we understand these things. There are many molecules out there that contain alkenes. They contain double bonds. And that double bond is made up of a sigma bond and a pi bond. Okay? It is described as a double bond, but it's made up of two different components. And one of the problems with organic chemistry is that we've adopted this sort of idea to show both of those bonds. But the lines are the same. But you've got to remember they're not the same in reality. One of them is sigma, and one of them is pi. Now, what orbitals overact, well, sorry, what orbitals interact to give you pi bonds? P orbitals, right? We should know that. P orbitals give you pi bonds. They always will here. So in this molecule, which is ethylene, which is the precursor to things like plastics, polyethylene, a uh, massive, massive commodity chemical made on multi-ton scale, uh, this now is, is a different picture. It's a different pattern. If you build a model, it has a different shape. In fact, this is flat. We'll call this trigonal planar when we get to some more detail later on, but trigonal, three, and planar just means flat, planar. All the atoms are arranged in a plane. The two carbons now are definitely not sp3 hybridized because they have a pi bond available or involved. You have to explain that pi bond. So I can't use the sp3 pattern, I have to go someplace else. I'm going to use something called an sp2 pattern. And every time you see a carbon or an nitrogen with an oxygen with one pi bond involved, it's sp2 hybridized. That's what we'll do in restation is put up some big ugly molecules and you can identify very quickly that this is consistent. Well, different pattern requires a different idea of, of the hybridization. We have to mix different orbitals to get here. And we have to keep in mind that we need some pi. Okay, I'm going to make a pi bond, so I'm not going to use all my orbitals. So the picture here, going back to the basics, I have these orbitals available to me. I have a single s orbital, and I have three p orbitals. I have to mix them together to give me something that makes sense here, because again, this picture just doesn't make sense. If I've got all p orbitals, Maybe I make three pi bonds. That's not the case in the actual molecule. I've got to explain the actual molecule. So what we'll do here is instead of mixing all the orbitals, I'll mix this with this and this. Sp2. Easy enough? I'm only using two of the p orbitals because I don't need that third one because I need to make a pi bond. So we'll get a different shape, a different pattern. Sp2. And again, the hybrid orbitals, their energy is somewhere in between where we started for S and P. Over here now, we have a new picture, something called sp2. There are three of them, because I took a single s, and I took two of the p's. That's three orbitals. So now I've got this picture over here. Where I've got three orbitals on the right-hand side, called sp2. Any comments? Anybody want to say anything? Go ahead. But this is a different molecule. It's a reality in nature that you have alkenes. We are trying to explain that reality. Yeah, if this just had single bonds, I'd be stuck in SP3. This class would take about three weeks to cover. Right? But I've got the three patterns, which then build up a huge, great universe. So I've got to be careful here. So now, let me do that again. I don't need all the P orbitals this time, because I need to keep one of them in reserve to make a pi bond. That's what this is here. I didn't touch it. That is still a P orbital on the right-hand side. So to get my new picture, I leave one of the p orbitals alone. I only mix the s and two of the p's. That's where sp2 comes from, one third s, two thirds p in terms of what they look like. And that gives you these hybrid orbitals over here, and that's sp2. And again, these will give you the sigma bonds. They will couple up with another atom, which brings along another electron, and you'll get a bond from each of those. And then the p orbitals left over, it will couple up with another p orbital from another atom and give you a pi bond. Go ahead. That's it. That's it. Unless. I'll leave unless for later. But yeah, you're, you're fine right now. Okay? Go ahead. Nets. No, because they're all the same. They're all the same. And these are just labels we put on them, right? You probably can't tell exactly which one is which. They're just labels we put on them to track them, to keep an eye on them. So as long as you leave one alone, you've got yourself a pi bond. And the rest of them, I'll repeat this, the hybrid orbitals go to the single bonds. Now, if I think about how this comes together, and how I can explain the structure of something like ethylene, CH2CH2, here's exactly what, what we think happens, or what is, what is involved here. This now is the picture for an sp2 hybrid carbon. It has three orbitals that were hybridized. It has three sp2 orbitals. Now, if the furthest away 
four orbitals can get from each other is a tetrahedron, then the furthest away three orbitals are going to get from each other isn't a tetrahedron. Is that okay? Four orbitals, tetrahedron. Try it with your models if you have them. Three orbitals, the furthest away they can get from each other, when they're populated, is going to be flat. It's going to be trigonal planar. So that the orbitals are pointing in these directions, right? To the three corners of a regular triangle. That's the framework that will be used to form the single bonds. And I'm trying to drop some hints here. It is the single bond framework that dictates the shape of the molecule. The pi bonds are irrelevant, right? Pi bonds are, are, are an afterthought in terms of the shape, really. It is the sigma framework, the single bond framework, that dictates the shape of the molecule. Four of those single bonds, tetrahedral. Three of those single bonds, now trigonal planar, different shape. Why are they pointing in those directions? That's the furthest they can get from each other. It's all about repulsion and not wanting to be close to another orbital or another electron. Well, what's left over after you've done that is the p orbital. And this is just a picture of a single sp2 hybridized carbon. Now, the furthest away that p orbital can get from the flat framework is 90 degrees, up and down. It's not tilted. It's straight up and down. It's the furthest away that orbital can get from the other orbitals. So we now have a fairly complex picture for sp2 in which the hybrid orbitals, the sp2 orbitals, go to the single bonds, and the p orbital is left over to form a pi bond. But get this, as you're reading, it's not so obvious. This is the description for one atom. We're making a molecule here which has two carbons bonded to each other. So you have to bring a second carbon along with similar needs and similar features and similar structures to bond together. So when we start thinking about how we make this ethylene molecule, here's the initial overlap of the sigma bond. That's the glue holding those two atoms together along the sp2 framework. Hydrogen over here, hydrogen over here, sp2 with, through 1s for the hydrogen. That's the hybridization pattern in that bond. And what we've got left over is this. And these two, this is important, these two orbitals, the p orbitals, have to be, you may know this already, have to be parallel. They have to be approximately the same size, and they have to be pointing in the same direction. You can't form a pi bond if they're at 90 degrees to each other. That will become very important later when we talk about the chemistry. So right now, similar size, same direction, parallel. Then you'll get overlap, and then you'll form a pi bond. And we can draw that now as this. So those two lines in that molecule are actually quite complicated. These two little lines in the middle to show that double bond are very complicated. One of them is a sigma bond formed between two sp2 orbitals from adjacent carbons. The other line is the pi bond formed between two adjacent parallel p orbitals. So my picture so far on my last slide, this is for one atom. This is just for one of the carbons. You must have some partner next door with the same needs to be able to overlap and give you that system. So far, so good. Hello. Question over here. It's overlapping. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, you can overlap in the middle like this, and then you overlap at the top like that. Okay? And you get a pi bond. Joe. You look like a Joe. Well, think about this again. We're trying to explain what's out there. I'm not making, I don't make up most of the stuff I tell you. <laughs> most of the stuff I tell you has experimental evidence. Yes. So we're explaining nature. We're explaining the fact that if you put some of these molecules in an X-ray diffractometer like you can in Ward Beecher, you, you bombard this thing with X-rays, that molecule's flat. The structure you get back is flat. My job as a chemist is to explain why that structure is flat. Yeah, I just want to know how many you mix an S orbital and an SP orbital. Because, well, why can you mix a 1s and a 1s orbital? Because it benefits the system to become a bond. Same idea, 1s and sp2, one electron each, coupled together to make a bond, molecules more stable. Make sense? Go on. Sure, sure. You've got to be careful here because we're just laying out the, the play, you know, you're laying out the Lego bricks to play the game. Okay? Later on, we'll say that alkenes are not as stable as alkanes. Alkenes are more reactive than alkanes because maybe sigma bonds are better than pi bonds. But in nature, these pi bonds are there. They might take the opportunity to become single bonds later, and that's a whole painful chapter later on. Uh, but this is what we're laying out now. This is, that, this is out there. This is the playing field. At the back. This is the p orbital. Part of it is above, and part of it is below. Got it? So we have sp2. Flat, single bond framework, the orbital projecting itself above and below that at 90 degrees, bring two of those things together with the equal needs, they bond. Just as a 1s, 1s would bond, you get a better molecule. 
Fair enough, sp3, tetrahedral, sp2, trigonal planar. The third one, there are only three. The third one here is quite different. The third one now typifies things like alkynes, acetylene that you use in blowtorches, things like that. Uh, this is a different molecule. This has a triple bond. And again, in that triple bond, one of those lines represents sigma, and two of those lines represent pi bonds. Can't be sp2, didn't have the right bits and pieces. Can't be sp3, that was all single bonds. This is different. So I've got to worry about shape, I've got to worry about direction and space, I've got to worry about projection of orbitals, I've got to worry about how to get that picture. How do you actually get to this place? This shape is said to be linear. The furthest away you can get from somebody else is running away in the other direction, right? So the furthest away you can get from two electrons or two orbitals from each other is to be pointing in the opposite direction. So we'll describe these alkynes and molecules like them as linear. Fairly simple. This is incredibly useful in pharmacy and medicine, uh, pharmaceutical chemistry to be able to project things into space when you're building drugs. These different structures allow you to probe space in all kinds of different ways. Different system requires a different bonding pattern. I can't use sp3, I can't use sp2, I've got to do something different. This will be sp. This is the third of them. So I'm back to my original picture. I'm back to where I was trying to explain reality. I have this machinery from the periodic table, it is not adequate for this picture. I've got the potential for one bond right there. I've got the potential for another bond right there. It doesn't quite fit, because I'm not going to use p orbitals for single bonds. I'm going to use some s components. I'm going to use the lower energy orbitals to make myself some single bonds. So what I need to do now is to keep in mind I need 2 pi. That's all you have to worry about. I need 2 pi. So instead of leaving one p orbital alone, leave two of them alone. Go to the right-hand side. I've got my two p orbitals, which happen to be occupied, in this case, by p electrons. I'll explain that in a minute. Those will contribute to the p orbitals, to the pi bonds. And I've got to be careful here. These are atomic orbitals, so I'll write two pi. They are going to become the pi orbitals. And down here, my hybrid orbitals, which are sp. Where do I get sp from? I took a single s and a single p, sp. How much s characteristic in an sp orbital? Percent-wise, half, 50%, yeah? Half and half. SP orbitals are a little bit more sort of stubby than the, regular, the other orbitals because they've got more S character. Joey? A typo. I don't do typos. What are you talking about typos? Two, one, two, fixed. Okay. <laughs> you need one of each, and you leave two of them alone. Why do I leave two of them alone? Because I need two pi bonds. Simple as that. So the projection into space is different. They're going to be linear. That's the furthest way they can get. And you can start to think about more complex molecules. And this is it. Once you've done sp3, sp2, sp, you have to go further and put them together with nitrogen and oxygen and stuff like that. But it's the same idea, same pictures. We have now a single bond framework coming from sp orbitals. And the furthest away they can get from each other is opposite directions linear. This will give you a sigma bond, and this will give you a sigma bond, which in the molecule looks like that. And the other atom involved looks like that. They're both linear, because they're both sp hybrids. Well, we then have two p orbitals. We have one pointing up and down. If one's pointing up and down, the furthest away the other one can get is at 90 degrees, orthogonal to it. Okay, Orthogonal at 90 degrees. The two p orbitals now are going to set up the pi bond. One pi bond, this is complicated, we'll see it again in recitation, we'll see it again when we do chapter, I think, I think it is 10 later on, when we do the alkynes themselves. I need some over, orbital overlap between the blue parts at the back, and maybe the red parts at the front, and the red parts at the top, and the blue parts underneath. All it is is the sort of balloons coming together, o overlapping to give you the bonds. So the shape is different, the hybrid pattern is different, it's not sp3, because I don't just have single bonds. It's not sp2, because I have more than one pi bond. It's sp, and that's it. You've got all three patterns now. You've got all three shapes. What shape is sp3? Tetrahedral, sp2. Trigonal planar, sp. Linear. That's it. That's, that's what you need to know today. So we can build this up in, in many different ways to ask questions, to understand it, to probe whether you know what you're doing, because very quickly you'll need to build off of this. We have some examples. I have a molecule here, hydrogen cyanide. And you know this is, this is a typical exam question for a few points. You'll be asked to draw the hybrid picture for this type of molecule or this type of situation. 
I have a carbon in the middle, which happens to have four bonds, as it should, to have eight electrons, and it has two single bonds coming out of it, and it has two pi bonds. So what hybridization pattern? SP. That's the first thing you need to recognize, SP. It's carbon, so I have six electrons to deal with. I've got 1s2, 2s2, 2px1, 2py1. This is the ground state atomic structure. Doesn't explain my molecule. I need to do something to it to fix this. So what I'll need to do is to worry about the hybridization pattern that I need. On the right-hand side, what the question will ask you to do is draw that pattern and then populate the orbitals to describe how this is going to bond. So I'm leaving my 1s where they are. Don't have to worry about those. Don't do anything. I then have to worry about sp. And sp means I'm taking a single s and one of the p orbitals. And the, the energy here is going to be somewhere in between where I started. So this could be described as my sp level. What's left over that I need, that I need to put in here? Two p orbitals. Why? Because I need two pi bonds. They should be the same energy where we, as where we started. Now, this is something that you've got to be careful with, and you've got to remember that you've been taught rules, and you fill up orbitals singly before they double up. So how many electrons do I have to distribute here? Four. The four valence electrons that carbon needs to form its bonds. Well, the first two are easy. Fill up singly before we double up. So here's a little bit further advanced. If you want to put a second electron into an orbital that's already half full, that's going to take some energy. That's going to cost you. Yeah? You're putting a negative thing in the same space as a negative thing. So the argument here is that it actually takes less energy because these p orbitals aren't that far away energy-wise. It takes less energy to go here than it does to jam them into an extra p orbital, into an, to an s orbital. So we are filling up singly before we're doubling up, and something you may not have seen before is that these p orbitals aren't that far away energy-wise, and it takes less energy to put one there than it does to cram it into that half-filled s orbital. That might be something new. Well, what I've got now is a nice orbital picture for sp hybrid carbon. And then I have to worry about projection in space, my shape, and worry about which orbitals do which jobs. These are the sp orbitals, the hybrid orbitals. What type of bonds do they form? Single, sigma. And I've left some p orbitals left over because I need what? Two pi bonds. That's it. That's your hybrid orbital picture. Go ahead. Because I left them where they are. Here, here, I'm trying to show is the same energy as over here. But because I mixed an S and a P, they should be somewhere in between, right? So the SP are lower than the P orbitals. The P orbitals are the same because they're still P orbitals. It's good stuff, this. So hopefully you get something like that. There's my picture. Same idea. The problem is getting into it. Most of you are signed up already and doing homework. That's good. Make sure by today, by tomorrow, you're, you're in, on, in the game because it'll start to get pretty busy pretty quickly. Other example, oxygen. Oxygen is totally different, or is it? The only difference with oxygen is more electrons. It still can fit into the same patterns, though. If you had to look at that oxygen, which just has single bonds, what shape are we? What, what sort of pattern are we expecting? SP3, we certainly are. SP3. You'll see where the lone pairs come from very quickly. In fact, I have lone pairs in this picture. There's a lone pair, there's a lone pair, simply a filled orbital. The problem with this picture is that those two orbitals of those two lone pairs are not the same energy. In that molecule, they are the same energy. So how do we explain that? We have to work out a model that will explain why the lone pairs are the same, identical. So I'm thinking SP3. I'm thinking over here. I'm leaving my 1s alone. Never use it. Don't need to. If I'm dealing with sp3, how many hybrid orbitals do I need? Four. And they need to be somewhere in between the energy of where we started. There's four. How many electrons do I have to distribute? Six. There's the difference between carbon and oxygen, right? Number of protons, number of electrons, what have you. So I'm going to put one here to fill up singly. I'm going to put one here to fill up singly, then here, and then here. Now where do I go? I go back and double up. I don't have any p orbitals. I go back and I double up, and all of a sudden, my pattern makes sense. What are these two things here? They are the lone pairs. And what's nice about them now? They are the same. They are the same shape, the same size, the same energy. They are identical through my hybrid picture. And these two orbitals and their electrons will go to form what? 
sigma, and I'm writing two sigma because that's where they go. You can do this with carbon, you can do it with nitrogen, you can do it with oxygen. Memorize this stuff, okay, it'll hurt. Understand this stuff, you can, you can amaze your friends. It isn't that difficult if you put the time in. Anybody? Hello. Not in this, not in this stuff, no. No. Don't need to. You've got other alternatives. So are you having fun yet? Okay, good. Let's carry on. Okay. There's the pattern. There's the picture. We have the orbitals we need. We have the explanation. We have something that makes sense of the natural system, and we're happy with it. Go on. I know your name, but I've forgotten it. Ashley, go on. It is roughly tetrahedral. There's a lot more to come on that in the near future. But it's roughly tetrahedral, yes. Yes, absolutely. So it's logical, this stuff. It, it builds on itself, and if you keep up, you're okay. Go on, what's your name? Michaela. Michaela. Go on, Michaela. Uh, you will by uh, Wednesday. Yes, it's bonded to... It's, you can see there are two single bonds coming off it. And what's next to it are carbons, but we need to go do chapter two to tell you that carbons have been omitted for clarity. Okay, so let's think about finishing this chapter up because it really is just transition. It is a chance to get back into it after the summer. Uh, the idea of bond strengths and bond energies and bond lengths and bond sizes will be important when we start talking about molecules interacting and doing chemistry. So here we have a, three pictures of typical molecules or organic molecules that contain sp3, sp2 and sp type of atoms. And I've always equated this to like a rubber band or an elastic band. A single bond is like an elastic band, just do that, okay? It's fairly flexible. It's not very tight. Well, if you go to a double bond, you've basically taken that elastic band and turned it over twice, right? You've made it half the length. Is it tighter or is it looser? What is it? Tighter. Is it shorter or longer? Shorter. Is it stronger or weaker? Stronger, right? Same idea. And you do that again with the triple bond, you get a shorter bond in between because you've got more glue holding the atoms together and you get a stronger bond because it's now a triple bond. So it's fairly simple. You don't need to worry about those numbers just yet. We will not worry about the bond energies at the bottom later, but they are different. And they are different as a consequence of the fact that they have different organizational patterns around the central atoms that give us these molecules that are in nature. So what we've done so far today is explain some of these patterns, some of these shapes with a model that has been developed that fits and it works. Joe, you okay? Good man. All right. Finishing up, not too much to do to the end here. Uh, we've got something called a steric number. I don't really remember using this much uh, in my own training. It's basically, uh, I think, the, the question Michaela asked about what do you know else is attached? And once you know that you've got four things attached, it's tetrahedral probably. Uh, in this case, you've got a steric number of four on CH4 because there are four other atoms attached. Steric means size, it means volume. So there are four volumes attached, four hydrogens. In the middle, it doesn't look so obvious. You've got three things attached, but you must remember the lone pair. In fact, most of this course is about lone pairs. So you must remember where they are, and you must remember that they are there. So I have what we call a steric number of four because I have four valences. You can equate it to the number of valences. On the right-hand side, water, you've got two definite single bonds, and you've got two lone pairs. Those lone pairs definitely count as valences. They are definitely important because that's where atoms will stick to. Jordan. So this is a good question that we're going to deal with throughout the two terms. On the left, I have four equivalent bonds. So I have four equivalent angles within those bonds. I have four equivalent bond lengths. As I move to NH3, it's not equivalent anymore. I've got three CH bonds or three NH bonds. I've got one lone pair. That lone pair has a different influence over its neighbors. You might remember from freshman chem, they occupy more volume, they repel more, and so the lone pair has more influence, and that's why it's a little bit different in terms of its shape. And then if you move to the right with water, two lone pairs, again, a little bit different in shape because of the overarching uh, influence of those lone pairs. Ashley. They are, they are now, the three molecules amongst themselves are all slightly different, I was taught to treat them as tetrahedra, 
And the, as you move from the perfect tetrahedron to a distorted tetrahedron and a more distorted tetrahedron, and they've picked up these different names. Trignal pyramidal, okay. You'll deal with that later on when we do substitution reactions. You'll see that phrase again. Uh, bent, it's obvious, it's twisted. Uh, but it, they are definitely roughly tetrahedra. Right? The bond angles become more apparent later. If you've got no lone pairs, the bond angles are said to be 109. You've probably picked this up as you read. And again, we've got to go back and do these individual compounds later, so you'll see these numbers again. Tetrahedral, 109.5 degrees. That's the furthest away they can get from each other, the bonds. In the middle, trigonal pyramidal. This bond, this, this angle now is changing a little bit. It's becoming smaller. The angle between the neighbors is becoming a little bit smaller. That's because the lone pair has more influence. It is compressing the bonds closer together. That's why the angle changes. If you have two lone pairs, it goes down to 105 degrees. That's because two lone pairs compress a bit more again. Compress, and the bonds get closer together. So the bond angle changes. But these are approximate structures that will be seen again and again as we work our way through the two terms. Okay. This slide, to me, I, I put it up there because it's in the book. To me, this is more of a nuisance than it really is a help. You can use this, but I think you might get lost. I think I've summarized this stuff today. If it's SP3, if it's all single bonds, it'll be approximately tetrahedral, or distorted based on lone pairs being present. If it's SP2, it'll be trigonal planar every day of the week. If it's SP, it'll be linear. So that's just a summary of what we just talked about. The basic patterns you have to know to be able to put these things together and play Lego bricks. That's all it is. Okay, looking at this system, uh, the sort of thing we will do in recitation today and Wednesday, getting ready for a quiz and finishing off the homework. I've got a more complex molecule now. Acetone you'll use. Uh, uh, be careful, fellas. It's nail polish remover, so take your nail polish off in lab. Uh, you use this to wash your dishes. Be very, very careful. Uh, it's, it's not particularly good for you. But it's a simple organic molecule. What's the hybridization pattern right there? SP3, what about right there? SP2, what about right here? SP2. Practice it. Get used to it. If you're not happy with it, ask questions. Fundamental principle. Fundamental idea to be able to do organic. Now, to finish off, I've got a few bits and pieces here. Uh, I've got some random stuff. We talk about dipoles again. Now we know a bit more about shape, tetrahedral, we can talk about dipoles. This molecule does have a dipole because we have a carbon and a chlorine. If I were to put delta positive in this molecule, where would it go? Carbon or chlorine? Carbon, because it's less electronegative. What is the electronegativity of carbon? 2.5, electronegativity of chlorine? 3.0. So we ought to have a delta negative up there. Nice and easy. Uh, we see a dipole here. We see, again, the electron density map that shows that, where the electrons are being pulled towards the chlorine. Uh, if I put two chlorines on, I have a situation now where they both will be pulling electron density away from the central carbon. And overall, the dipole is an average of those two. That should make some sense. But you move to this one at the top. Why is there no dipole there? They all cancel out. They're all like vectors. They all cancel out. They're going in opposite directions or the different directions, which all overall cancel out. Uh, one you need to be careful with here. We'll talk about this again in restation. Carbon dioxide. That looks like it should be polar. It looks like the middle carbon is losing out to the oxygens, but it has no dipole. Why not? They cancel. Opposite directions, they cancel. So no dipole in that system. That's one of the practice problems that's out there on the, um, in the book. So this table is just a collection of numbers. It is stuff we will see over the next nine months, all based on that simple idea. And again, you will find that those simple ideas that we're building up this week are key for what's to come next. Don't even worry about that slide uh, until we get to those types of compounds later on individually. This stuff is logical. Physical properties are dictated often by polarity. If you have a polar molecule, it quite often is higher boiling than a non-polar molecule. And this is very simple and based, based on things you've already seen before. The interactions between molecules, intermolecular forces, IMF, remember this from freshman chem? Intermolecular forces, what holds molecules together? I'm going to talk about this in more detail on Wednesday to finish this off and then get into chapter two. But I want you to start thinking about lab. What is boiling? What happens when something boils? It becomes a gas, yes, but what's happening when something boils? Molecule, say that again. Not bonds are being broken, right? Bonds not within molecules, but the forces between molecules. There's a vast difference between intermolecular forces and intramolecular forces. 
So you think about how, for example, water at zero degrees is a solid, right? What's happening when you warm it up is the bonds, not the bonds, but the interactions between the molecules are starting to be broken. And those molecules are getting further apart and it becomes a liquid. And then you boil it at 100 degrees, even further apart, they become a gas. I'm going to leave you with that thought. And on Wednesday, we'll finish this off. And I'm into chapter two. So get on it. Thank <laughs> you.